Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Garth Hopkins. I'm with the uh, Caltrans Headquarters Division of Transportation Planning and just here to introduce our, uh, our uh, panel today. Um, I want to welcome the speakers to our, our first panel session uh, in a series of four discussions that we're going to have uh, relating to emerging, you know, planning for the 21st century and emerging trends. Exciting topics. Um, you know, we've invited uh, thought leaders from several universities and industry to talk about the latest challenges and trends in the field of transportation and visioning uh, during the course of these four sessions. Um, just to let you know, the sessions are going to be webcast, and the viewers are all for all over California, and then uh, will also be uh, this will be archived on the Caltrans website for viewing uh, at a later date. Um, so the first session we have here today is titled Bike and Pedestrian Issues in Transportation Planning. And like I said, this is the first in a series of four um, sessions that we have. And just to give you an update uh, or give you an overview in terms of what the others are, uh, the next one will be on October 19th, The Challenge of Suburban Office Landscape and Understanding the Past Revision to the Future. Uh, and then following that, the third one will be on October 30th, and it's the role of big data in transportation planning. And then uh, lastly, is uh, we still haven't determined the date on that, the last session will be on transportation, public health, and environmental justice. So is, those are all four very interesting topics and something that uh, I'm sure we'll get a lot of good information of. Um, but in, at any rate, you know, back to uh, this particular panel on bike and pedestrian issues and transportation planning. Um, you know, this fits in right with, our, with the current revised uh, mission and vision statements that we have here at Caltrans. You know, we're, uh, Caltrans, we really uh, want to go for a more a sustainable, multimodal, and integrated transportation system in California. And this discussion on bike and pedestrian is definitely going to be one of those key important items. Um, today, we, we hope to learn more about what can be done to make bicycling and then also pedestrian uh, traffic a little bit more uh, viable and usable here in California and to see what uh, emerging trends are here in our state uh, in this area. You know, data is shown from the most recent the California Household Travel Survey that bicycle usage is going up in our state, and, you know, we think that's fantastic, and we want to do whatever we can from a Caltrans perspective to promote that. Um, this session will be moderated by Susan Shaheen, uh, who's a co-director over at the, uh, the UC Berkeley, the Transportation Sustainability uh, Research Center. And uh, I'll let her introduce the rest of the panel members. And, and then... Um, Lastly, I just kind of really wanted to thank some of the other folks that helped make this happen. Um, you know, and, and then also it's the uh, UC Connect, UC Berkeley, and then also staff, Caltrans staff here uh, that helped facilitate this as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Susan. Thank you. Thanks so much, Garth. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here to kick off uh, this new Emerging Trends uh, speaker series. I think it's really exciting. So uh, my name is Susan Shaheen, and I'm a co-director of the Transportation Sustainability Research Center at UC Berkeley. And I uh, am really fascinated by the issue of safety and bike and ped issues. And I think the challenge that faces us as we move into the future around sustainability, how can we integrate more of these modes into our plans? So we have a really exciting lineup for today. Uh, we have two speakers. We had initially planned for third, but uh, unfortunately, Sherry Ryan will not be able to join us today. So that means you get a little bit more time with each of our uh, distinguished speakers. Our first speaker is Anastasia Sidiris, and uh, she is an associate dean of academic affairs and urban planning professor at UCLA. And she is uh, at the School of Public Affairs as well. Her research focuses on the public environment of the city, its physical representation, aesthetics, social meaning, and impact on the urban resident. So welcome, Anastasia. And Anastasia will be focusing today on how safety and security considerations affect walking. So her presentation will address a number of important questions, such as what is the link between perceptions of risk, fear, and walking and biking? How perception of safety may vary because of socio-psychological, demographic, and environmental factors? Also, what are the appropriate design and policy interventions that can help people feel safer in transportation settings? 
And then our second presenter is uh, my colleague from UC Berkeley as well, Offer Grembrek. He's co-director of the UC Berkeley Safe Transportation Research and Education Center. His current research focuses on injury risk and multimodal environments, road user exposure to risk, and in-vehicle injury protection systems. Offer will uh, present on road safety management strategies for pedestrians and bicyclists. His presentation will focus on how professionals are obligated to make walking and cycling as safe as possible as people are being encouraged to walk and bike more for their transportation needs. So I think both of these are going to be wonderful presentations to, to get us started. I just thought I'd, before I bring them up to uh, the podium, talk to you a little bit about how we are thinking we can run this uh, two-hour session. So each of the speakers will um, speak for up to approximately 40 minutes. Uh, we decided that we would hold questions. And then what I'd like to do is start out by peppering them with a few questions and then really engage you in the dialogue here at Caltrans and also online. So I think we really want to talk about how can we integrate cycling and walking into the planning process at Caltrans. So start getting your thinking caps on as we're hearing these wonderful presentations and start queuing up those questions because we really want to hear from you. And with that, I want to turn it over to our first speaker, Anastasia. Well, thank you, Susan. And I would like to thank um, UC Connect and Caltrans for organizing that. It is a privilege to be here. And it's always wonderful to come to Sacramento because I feel it's a city where you don't need to be stuck in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic all the time. So I was amazed that we zoomed through the airport in 10 minutes, almost 12 minutes. And uh, I think the taxi driver was kind of laughing at me because I asked at 3 o'clock, uh, is it going to take us one and a half hour to get to the airport? And he looked at me and he said, are you coming from L.A.? I said, yes. No. So, it's... <laughs> so um, I think that... The... What, what? 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Yeah, he said the same thing. You don't need to worry. So, fantastic. But I, I have to say that some of these non-motorized modes would be as appropriate in Sacramento as they are, of course, in, in uh, Los Angeles and many other uh, many other places in the U.S., and I know that for some of you I may be uh, preaching to the choir when I say that there are some very important uh, benefits when we're talking about alternative transportation modes. Uh, we're talking, of course, about environmental benefits and lower greenhouse emissions because we're talking about non-motorized modes. We're talking about economic benefits, lower levels of um, fuel consumption, energy consumption, lower traffic congestion. That's something we do worry about a lot in, uh, in LA uh, because this translates to, to better productivity. If you're stuck in traffic for two hours to go and two hours to come back, you arrive at the office, you're extremely frustrated, not too much productivity there. And of course, health benefits. And actually, these were now more and more we hear from public health professionals that are telling us that it is important not only to inhale clean air, we knew that all along, but also to walk and to bike and to do physical exercise. It does translate to better outcomes. However, I want to say that what you can see from this table, uh, the mode share of commuters who are walking to work has dropped significantly since 1960. You can see in 1960 they represented 9.9% uh, of the commuters. Uh, by 2010, this has dropped to 2.9%. Um, we are doing a little bit better in terms of bicycling. Uh, you see a little bit of a bump, uh, but not that much better. And if you add these cumulatively, we see that it is still a declining share of commuter, commuters despite the fact that we know more about these benefits. We're much more aware. Transportation planners are much more aware. At UCLA, we're teaching now for a number of years a very popular class on uh, bicycle planning, and I know that most planning departments around the nation have incorporated some of these alternative modes of uh, transportation in their um, curriculum. So... Researchers, oh, and, and here is another graph pretty much showing the same thing, but in a more uh, 
graphic terms where you see the steep decline in terms of walking to work and a little bit of a push upward in terms of, of bicycling. So um, researchers have for quite some time investigated the factors that may affect the preponderance of walking or biking. Uh, what may encourage us to walk or bike, what may discourage us. And if, you know, trying to categorize these factors, they talk about individual level capacities, so sociodemographic characteristics. Typically, younger people tend to bike more than more senior people. Cultural characteristics and behavioral characteristics, lifestyle preferences, all these are bunched under these individual level capacities, but also society level capacities and characteristics, social norms. Is it prevalent? If you go to uh, Holland, you see all the people on, on bike. If you go to Saudi Arabia, you don't. Uh, public policies, if they encourage, um, if they encourage alternative modes of transportation, market forces, and something that I'm particularly interested in uh, because of my background as a planner and urban designer, the built environment and urban form characteristics. It is much easier to walk on and bike in certain types of built environment. It is much more difficult to walk and bike in other parts of in certain cities or certain neighborhoods where we are faced with long blocks, very wide streets, sometimes no sidewalks. So um, this webinar, at least in my talk in this webinar, will focus between, between the built environment and one particular characteristic of the built environment, its perceived or actual safety, and walking and biking. And the questions I want to address are, what is the link between perceptions of risk, fear, and walking and biking? How perceptions of safety may vary because of socio-psychological demographic and environmental factors, and what are appropriate design and policy interventions that can help people feel safer and thus walk and bike more? Because I think the link has been established by many, many scholars, and I think it's also quite intuitive that if you feel unsafe, either because of crime or because of traffic, you're not likely to walk or you're not likely to bike. So fear, criminologists are telling us is an emotional response of dread or anxiety, and there is a causal, a direct relationship between fear and perceived risk. And what I note here is that safety or lack thereof can be either perceived or actual. But the other point I want to make, as transportation planners, this doesn't really matter, because if people perceive something as unsafe, they are not going to walk or bike, even if the numbers do not justify sometimes these perceptions. So what people perceive as important is what will shape subsequent beliefs and behaviors. That's why perceived safety is as important. And I want to note that there are different sorts. I mentioned about the, the link between uh, fear and perceived risk. And there are different sources of risk or danger and related to different safety concerns. So we have two big categories, um, human sources of danger that may involve, for example, heavy traffic, reckless drivers that lead to pedestrian or bike automobile crashes, or criminals that are uh, you know, lead to crime and, and, and violence and victimizing people to the extent that they don't want to walk or bike. But we also can face non-human envir or environmental um, sources of danger that may also affect walking and biking. Unattended dogs that may lead to injury from bites, poor roadway infrastructure. I'm talking about these cracked sidewalks uh, from tree roots, for example, that may lead from, to injuries from falls and, again, pedestrians falling and uh, even some bikers that are on the sidewalks, again, pedestrian and automobile uh, crashes. So a number of studies have examined the link between safety or lack of safety and walking. And I'm summarizing now in very few major points 
a ton of literature. Uh, we know that perceived safety is one of the most important prerequisites for walking. We need to feel safe in order to walk. We know that there is a negative association between fear of crime and walking. And there is also a negative association between perceived traffic safety and walking and biking. So basically, if we feel there is a lot of traffic and the environment is unsafe, we're afraid to walk and bike. There is also higher prevalence of inactivity and obesity among those who perceive their neighborhoods as unsafe. And there are three types of factors that influence, I'm going to start talking first about fear of crime and then about you know, fear of traffic safety. There are three types, when I'm talking about fear of crime, there are three factors or categories of factors influencing fear of crime. There are psychological factors. If, for example, we have been previously victimized, it's much more likely that we're more scared if we have memories, negative memories of a place, but also media stories, parental and societal admonitions about dangerous places versus safe places. This may instill fear in, in people about particular environments. There are sociodemographic factors that I'll, I'm going to talk a bit more in, in, a, in a second. Uh, gender characteristics, race, ethnicity characteristics, age, and even income characteristics may relate to levels of fear that we may have of particular environments and transportation settings. And also, and I'm going to also focus on that, some of the physical characteristics of places that may generate more fear. So talking a bit more about the sociodemographic characteristics, we know that almost every fear of crime survey finds women, finds women to be typically more fearful than men. Uh, and this, and I know this because I have done many, many surveys of both men and women and transit riders and people waiting at the bus stop, may lead women to avoid walking, biking, or even using public transit because it involves walking to reach the bus stop and it involves waiting at the bus stop setting, or change their behavior, for example, only using walking and biking during daylight, uh, or only using certain bus stops because they are more well attended or better surveyed by, by the surroundings. A British study, actually, of women's fears in public setting found that women anticipated risk in a number of transportation settings, in multi-story parking structures, public transit stations and bus stops, alleyways and underground passages. However, however, and actually the literature calls this intersectionality, classifying all women as the same, as belonging to the same category and everybody being afraid, ignores some important differentiations that exist uh, because of age, race, class, cultural, and educational background, sexual orientation, and disability status. So um, fear of crime can be affected profoundly by some of these modifiers. Empirical studies, for example, find um, that older women typically are feeling less safe in public environments than younger women. Uh, lower socioeconomic status is often connected with living in more unsafe neighborhoods. And so for this reason, a lot of people who live in the unsafe neighborhoods and are more low income are more scared about public settings. We also, for the same reason, typically we find people of ethnic or minority backgrounds having higher levels of fear. And also certainly, and you can understand this, people with physical and mental disabilities are more fearful in public spaces. Um, as I mentioned, studies have found higher fear of crime and more barriers to walking in ethnic and immigrant neighborhoods because a lot of times we have higher crime rates in these neighborhoods and physical health professionals have linked these higher levels of perceived unsafety with higher levels of inactivity and higher levels of uh, childhood diabetes and obesity and some of these really bad health uh, effects. Age. Age, older adults for whom walking is the prominent physical activity 
are very much influenced by safety and security concerns. Many elders are particularly afraid of the different dangers that may await them when walking in public. And I'm talking about mostly walking here. Um, the poor condition of the roadway infrastructure uh, increases their risk of falling. Uneven and cracked sidewalks are tough to negotiate for many seniors, and especially if you are on a wheelchair. At the same time, um, and that's something that probably Offer knows very well, children and seniors represent the highest risk group for automobile pedestrian collisions as, as victims. And actually, I wanted to show you this graph that shows older women and men feeling less safe and reporting physical inactivity. So the more less safe they feel, the less amount of physical inactivity. This is from an earlier uh, study of CDC, and also you see the gender differences and the age differences in, in this graph. The other issue that I think is, uh, I actually, uh, how many of you walked to school when you were, when you were young? Okay, well, great. I was anticipating that. I walked to school, although in another country, but it doesn't matter. How many of you or your, your children or grandchildren are walking to school now? I mean, you made my point. I really, you know, have to say very little. But this is a phenomenon not only in the U.S., in Great Britain, in, in Australia, in almost all the countries of the global north that we see that the children's trip to school has switched from walking and biking to being chauffeured. And there is a very good reason for that. It is parents' fear of either stranger danger or traffic safety. And this, has, this is from a TRB study of 2002 that found that when parents were asked about the barriers to children walking to school, 40% said traffic as a major concern. And this is also a graph that shows how children from that same study now, it is um, 13 years old, but I'm willing to bet that very little has changed. Uh, you see, you know, how little bicycling in particular and walking uh, is, is the most share of children going to school. Let's talk a little bit about some of the built environment characteristics because they have the power to affect people's perception of risk, certain environmental factors. Researchers have continuously found that neighborhood so-called incivilities, and what are the physical incivilities? Disorder, graffiti, litter, unkempt and abandoned buildings, overall poor environmental quality. These types of incivilities raise perceptions of risk and fear. In addition to incivilities, a number of environmental features also result in fear. Desolation, if you are in an environment that nobody, nobody is around you, may cause stress or fear. Darkness, low lighting, dark tunnels, walls, bushes that may conceal you, and if something bad is happening to you, people are not able to tell or, or help. Such features often limit the so-called prospect or the ability to see into a place where someone may be hiding. Such features may also provide refuge for someone, for a criminal, to wait for a potential victim. And also there are two particular types of spaces that may generate fear. Enclosed spaces with limited exit opportunities that you may feel you're trapped and if something happens, you cannot run or nobody is going to see you. Imagine if you are in an underpass. Imagine if you are in an elevator with someone that you don't know, that looks suspicious. And also anonymous and deserted open spaces that nobody, if something is going to happen, God forbid, nobody is going to know it. 
In fact, criminologists tell us that crime and the built environment are related in a very systematic manner. Different types of crime occur under different environmental conditions. As pickpocketing needs crowds to happen, and lots of crowds, congestion. Um, more serious, what the FBI calls type one crime, like rape or mugging, usually happen in more desolate spaces. So, um, Certain features of place can affect crime, uh, multiple escape routes, crime generating, land uses, uh, w physical disorder, broken windows. I'm going to say a few more things as, as we move on about, about this. However, I, if you know, all this sounds kind of uh, bleak and daunting, there are, there, is, there are some good news. There is the fact that we can do something about it through planning and design. Admittedly, we cannot fix you know, every crime situation, but there are environmental designs that can increase safety and perceived safety and make it easier for someone to get involved in walking and biking. Um, the first types of interventions I call fixing broken windows, uh, because it is shown that general neglect of the building stock and public environments, graffiti, litter, empty buildings, broken windows, literally and metaphorically, are signs that no one really cares. And if a criminal was to victimize someone, no one was going to mind. So physical interventions that reduce these fear-producing incivilities in public spaces, meaning, you know, upkeep the environment, especially near transportation settings, um, through painting, through picking up the trash. Some of these interventions are pretty simple, do not cost that much, but can counteract the broken window effect that is often present and generates fear in, in some neighborhoods. Jane Jacobs, the well-known um, urban critic of the 1960s, was the first to talk about eyes on the street. Uh, the idea that if there are more people around an environment, a public space, the chances of some crime occurring is, you know, diminish. So facilitating more eyes on the street through the design orientation of buildings with windows facing the street. I was actually visiting a couple of years ago a new development in, uh, in Stockholm, outside Stockholm, which is very much emphasizing transit and biking and walking. And almost every bus stop had a very good, I mean, the, the surrounding establishments, the apartment buildings, the shops, had a very good look at the bus stop. Uh, lots of eyes on, on the street. This is what is called natural uh, surveillance. So the placement of transit facilities away from desolate areas, this may even mean moving the bus stop a few feet down the block to place it in front of an open front establishment instead of in front of a wall. This makes a lot of difference. I have done studies of crime, bus stop crime in Los Angeles and surveying a lot of these bus stops and you find, you see the differences. Light, um, I think that is something that everybody knows. I left my car uh, at the Burbank airport today. I was sure to leave it under a light. Uh, it is much more, uh, it's psychological, but criminals don't like to get lit with a lot of light, flooded light. So where we can put more light, we are decreasing the possibilities of crime and perceived lack of safety. Eliminating bad neighbors. Uh, what I mean by that? Well, there are certain land uses that tend to associate with crime. Abandoned buildings, liquor stores, city motels, check cashing establishments where there is exchange of cash, pawn shops. So if we have the ability to locate a transportation setting away from these bad neighbors, we're doing a good thing. Creating safe territories, the creation of safe hangout places, such as senior citizen centers or a group of tables at benches uh, in a park, a well-attended bus stop, a plaza, can help a group feel safer and have more sense of territoriality and group ownership. And finally, and that's something that planners have started, transportation planners, working a lot in the last decade, protecting access routes to destinations, what they call the first mile, last mile uh, trip. 
the idea that it's not only when you are on the bus that you need to be protected, but the trip to the bus that involves walking needs to be uh, protected. So, so far I have been talking about crime, but I want to also turn a little bit um, in, to, to look into traffic safety, because this is also a major concern that affects preponderance of walking and biking. Uh, because for pedestrian activity to exist, there needs to be some kind of a symbiotic relationship between motorists and pedestrians. And many post-war neighborhoods, unfortunately, were developed with, not with the pedestrians in mind, but according to modern traffic engineering standards of the 1950s that were preoccupied with enhancing the speed of the automobiles, enhancing automobility. Many suburban residential neighborhoods have curb-to-curb -curb widths of 38 feet or more, um, and we have also quite often lack of sidewalks. Can you imagine what it takes to cross these streets, especially if you are uh, over 65? So there are a number of urban form impediments to walking and biking in the way that we have planned and designed our cities, especially our cities of the West Coast, I, I should say. What are these? They are very wide, difficult to cross streets. Lack of medians in many arterials that at least you can cut down the width and give the opportunity for the pedestrian to get some respite. Absent or obstructed sidewalks. I wrote a whole book about sidewalks and I'm teasing and I'm saying that people may think it's a very pedestrian topic, uh, but I think that it is an omnipresent part of the urban form that we have completely ignored. And if we really want to have pedestrians, we need to have good sidewalks, not only from walking, but also to reintroduce other social activities. Absence of pedestrian infrastructure, lighting, trees, crosswalks, and segregation of land uses requiring long walks. This huge blocks in downtown Los Angeles that you, know, you have to walk uh, in order to go to the corner, in order to cross, these are you know, anti-walking, not pro-walking. So uh, there are factors, the field of traffic safety, again, Offer is an expert here, has investigated the role of a number of factors that influence collisions, the social and behavioral characteristics of drivers and victims, if there is alcohol involved, the age, etc. but also road design characteristics, the type of road, the lane width, intersection geometry, pavement characteristics, marked crosswalks, raised medians, I assume that a lot of you are experts on that, the traffic characteristics, the traffic volumes, the traffic speeds have an impact on the number of collisions, but it is also the urban form characteristics that, that matter. So uh, this is a kind of a very condensed table, but I will try to say a few things. There are design and policy interventions that can be utilized to mitigate the effects of traffic and make neighborhoods safer for pedestrians and cyclists. At a minimum, and that's something that happens everywhere, all municipalities enforce a traffic code that regulates traffic through signals, roadway signs, crosswalks, pavement markings, etc. These, however, only provide a basic level of protection to pedestrians and cyclists. And we, in order to be effective and increase this mode share of these modes, we need to do much more. One of the things is to really customize some of these to the specific needs of particular neighborhoods. Are we talking about neighborhoods that have a lot of seniors? Maybe we need to have the light, the traffic light, for crossing the green light last long? Are we talking about neighborhoods that have a lot of kids? Maybe we need some also in addition to some, some traffic education courses in the local elementary schools. So um, these are some of the issues, but there are also issues and efforts to reduce vehicular traffic that should focus on the encouragement of alternative modes of transportation. And this can happen through policy incentives and design incentives, building better sidewalks, building pedestrian paths, building bike lanes. We are in a kind of a, at, at UCLA, that we have a lot of people biking and coming. There is, we are involved in a struggle with the local council person in order to create a bike path that leads to UCLA. 
you would think that this is something natural, and yet, you know, even to today, there is, there is a lot of um, uh, conflict about that. Of course, there are transportation planners have also talked about some strategies that are politically more difficult to implement, but where they have been implemented in other countries have been successful, namely to make the use of private automobiles more expensive. Uh, again, I talked about Stockholm, where it instigated a kind of a ring around the downtown area that if you cross with your car that ring, uh, automatically there is a fee that is applied, and at the end of the month you get a bill of how much you pay. This has reduced traffic by 30%, automobile traffic. Not very politically viable, I know, um, here, or other congestion pricing. But I still, we saw transportation agencies, even in Southern California, um, experimenting with some of these ideas or charging more to be on carpool lane at specific hours. A variety of innovative design means have been utilized by municipalities in Europe and Canada and in the U.S. to slow down traffic speeds in neighborhoods through traffic calming. I'm sure you're familiar with these. I'm not going to go into detail, but there are a number of deflections, horizontal deflections, vertical deflections, road narrowing, putting up medians, so that the car that enters the neighborhood is in a symbiotic relationship with the pedestrian and the cyclist. Um, in addition to design means, policy regulations like safety zones, 20 mile per hour zones, we're familiar with these around schools, well in certain European cities, they have started establishing them as home zones around, around um, residential areas. And these also would make the things more even between pedestrians and cyclists and motorists. And while the aforementioned me measures are primarily targeting the behavior of drivers, another set of interventions can target the behavior of pedestrians. Uh, and these involve education, information about traffic dangers, uh, helmet programs, tra training programs for children, etc. So, how am I doing for time? I'm about to conclude. Okay, so in conclusion, I would say that the design of the built environment should not impede the propensity for walking and biking. The link between built environment characteristics and safety from crime or traffic danger has been clearly established, we know it's true. Therefore, design and policy interventions aiming to enhance neighborhood safety are the necessary first steps for the encouragement of walking and cycling. So here again, interventions should be tailored to the particular subgroups and the characteristics of the neighborhood, mainly the physical and social characteristics. It is also important to evaluate if proposed interventions are reaching the populations who seem to be more in danger of physical inactivity and who display growing obesity problems and higher levels of fear. The children, the elderly, women, inner city residents, and low income people. I think I want to close with a kind of an optimist note. I want to say that I come from, well, I live, I don't come. I live in a city that is characterized the city of the automobile, but even in Los Angeles, we have seen a much, much more emphasis now in creating bike paths, in um, making it easier for pedestrians and bicyclists. And so I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Alfred Grambeck. I'm the co-director of UC Berkeley Safe Track. And uh, um, I have a problem when I, with my glasses. I can see well, but I cannot think well. But then without my glasses, I can think well, but I cannot see well. So I'm probably going to take them on and off. So whatever is ideal for that specific situation. Uh, um, so I might not be able to see all of your faces. Uh, my talk today 
is about road safety management for pedestrians and bicycles. And I'll start my talk uh, by doing a brief review. Uh, actually, it's not that brief, but doing a review of uh, uh, traffic safety patterns and trends and uh, uh, describing the scope of the problem and then identifying three uh, uh, reasons of why it is important to conduct road safety management strategies and road safety management in general for pedestrians and bicyclists. So uh, um, what is the, the traffic safety problem in California? So if we look at the past 10 years, there have been over 34,000 traffic fatalities across the state. If we look at the, at the pattern, we can see that uh, um, around 2004 to 2006, the number of fatalities peaked, and then the, it thought was followed by a few years of significant reduction that's probably associated more with an economic recession. So if you want to understand what's the, how we're doing currently, what's the current state, or what's the current scope of the traffic safety problem, we need to look at the past few years and uh, uh, what I'm doing here, I'm looking at how things have changed since the end of the recession, and I'm using 2010 to present that. So if you're looking at uh, um, what happened to the number of fatalities since 2010, so we can see that there is a 10% increase in fatalities uh, between 2010 and 2013. Uh, 2013 is the last year, is the most recent year of data that we have. Um, now, when we try to look at that number and see and break what happens when we break it up by different modes, uh, we start by looking at passenger vehicle fatalities, and we see a, a somewhat of a similar trend, but then we're noticing that since the, recess, the, the recession, the numbers are much more flat, and if we calculate the change in the number of fatalities for passenger uh, passenger, uh, passengers of vehicles, we see that uh, since 2010, there is only a 1% increase in passenger vehicle fatalities. Now, the, uh, the fact that that number has not changed much, we're attributing to uh, uh, traffic agencies that are focusing a lot on traffic safety, uh, the industry that is uh, uh, adding safety features into cars, uh, uh, a possible mode shift, uh, uh, which might be happening also. But at the end of the day, we see that for uh, 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 riders of passenger vehicles, the drivers of passenger vehicles, uh, um, uh, the, the number of fatalities is about the same. What happens when we're looking at uh, pedestrian fatalities? And again, um, we can see that in the past 10 years, it seems like it's somewhat flat, but it's because of the scale. But uh, uh, the numbers did peak around uh, 2005 and then declined with the recession. But then if we're looking again at the past four years, we're seeing that there actually is a 17% increase in pedestrian fatalities uh, uh, since 2010. When we're looking at bicycle uh, fatalities, we can see that, um, uh, again, the numbers are, are again low, but if we see, if we look at what happened to the uh, uh, pedestrian or bicycle fatalities since 2010, we can see that that number has increased much more. So there is a, uh, since 2010, there is a 41% increase in bicycle fatalities in California. So the first point that I want to make here is that uh, pedestrian and bicycle, I'm kind of using PB because it's a long uh, term to put in the title, but I'm going to use PB, P slash B when I'm talking about pedestrians and bicycles. But pedestrian and bicycle fatalities are increasing, and they're increasing in a rate that uh, uh, much higher than, it is than for other modes. So that is one reason why it is important for agencies to dedicate resources and to focus on road safety management for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, another thing that is uh, uh, challenging for pedestrians and bicyclists is that the relative vulnerability that they're exposed to in the traffic mix. So we have here two images of a bicyclist in a collision with a, a car and a pedestrian in a collision with a car. And we know that these modes, they are different in many ways, but they're also different in the kinetic energy that they actually carry. And that is another challenge and uh, uh, when we try to think of what it means to be a pedestrian or bicyclist in the traffic mix, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we can use something called the vulnerability matrix, something that we developed in our center. And what we have in this uh, vulnerability matrix 
is the rows represent, it kind of helps us capture uh, the, the, the fact that there are two sides to every crash. I don't know if you can still hear me if I move away from the microphone, but uh, um, I might move this a bit. I'll stay here. But it helps us capture the fact that there are two sides to every crash. So the rows, the rows here represent uh, a number of injuries that were suffered by specific modes, and we have here uh, uh, foot uh, um, pedestrian was too long to fit in this column, so I used foot instead. But pedestrian, bicyclists, P PTW is powered two wheels. That's motorcycles, and then uh, uh, automobiles, transit, and so on. And the columns include the same modes, but the columns represent the number of injuries inflicted by a mode. Now, the number of injuries inflicted and, uh, uh, and suffered does not represent fault. It represents which side of the, uh, or what entity in a crash uh, uh, suffered the injury. So, for example, if we have two entities that experience a crash, and in this case the entity on the left uh, suffered and uh, was injured, so we say that the entity on the right, or the road user on the right, inflicted an injury on the entity on the left. If both sides are injured, then it's a, 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 it counts for, two, uh, uh, for uh, uh, two injuries, and then we can say that the, that the entity on the right inflicted an injury on the entity on the left and the other way around. Okay? And when we uh, uh, take all of the data in California and apply it to this matrix, we actually get a... a sorry for flipping back and forth we actually get a picture of what modes are injuring what modes in the California traffic mix. So you can see here that if we think about, uh, uh, if we think about, let's see if this works. Yes, great. But then I might need to wear my glasses. But uh, uh, if we think about, uh, let's look at specific cells. Yeah, it's true. So we can see that... Um, So we can see that in so we can see that a thousand um, sorry so we can see that thirty two thousand four hundred and fifty five pedestrians were injured as a result of a crash with a car and if we look at another cell we can see or actually if we look at all of this first row we can see that in total there were uh, forty thousand two hundred and two pedestrian injuries in the California, um, uh, in California for a five-year period. If we look at the parallel number, we look, if we look at this column, this number represents the number of injuries that were inflicted by pedestrians on other modes. And in this case, that number is 10,088. Now the question arises, how can a pedestrian inflict an injury in another mode? And the way that can happen is if a result of a crash, a car can lose control, a car can uh, hit a light pole. So it's, it is also possible that the result of a crash with a pedestrian, uh, uh, a road uh, a driver or other road user occupant might experience an injury. And as expected, we can see that the number in this column, 10, the 1,088, is much smaller than the 40,000 injuries that the pedestrian experiences. Now, when we have this matrix and when we have these two numbers, we can actually calculate a ratio that we're calling here a relative vulnerability. And the way we're doing it is simply just dividing these two numbers, and it gives us a number that represents what's the relative vulnerability of pedestrians in the California traffic mix. So to some extent, it can be interpreted as uh, pedestrians suffer 37 times more injuries that they inflict. That's not surprising. We know they're more vulnerable, but it gives us an opportunity to actually calculate that number. We can do the same thing for bicyclists, and here we get a slightly smaller number, and, uh, which means, oh, the typo here, this should say bicyclists, but bicyclists suffer 14.88 uh, uh, um, times more injuries that they inflict in the California traffic mix. Now, when we do that for all of the different modes, across different modes, we actually get a vector that uh, uh, quantifies what is the relative vulnerability of each of the road users in California given the California traffic mix. Of course, if you take these road users and put them in a different traffic mix, maybe different built environment, different situations, the, the numbers might vary, but this is for California. 
And what we're seeing here is that uh, pedestrians and bicyclists are often referred to as vulnerable road users, and this confirms that they are indeed relatively more vulnerable than other road users in the California mix. So uh, uh, um, again, I'm using here PB. So it shows us this is the second reason why it is important to conduct road safety management for pedestrians and bicyclists because uh, they're also the most vulnerable road users. And the third thing is uh, uh, that safety is obtained or, or, or uh, uh, achieved by safety buffers. And when we think of passenger vehicles, um, these are more uh, conceptual diagrams, but there are three layers of safety buffers that they can obtain. The first layer of safety of, of buffers comes uh, from the environment, and that's very much the responsibility of transportation agencies and legislation on making sure that the environment is as safe as possible. The second safety buffer, especially for ve uh, passenger vehicles, comes from the industry, and they dedicate a lot of resources and energy to design and develop their cars in a way that would provide an additional safety buffer for uh, uh, um, their users. And then the third safety buffer is, of course, the road users themselves and how they actually behave and how they try to uh, keep themselves as safe as possible. So this is, these are the three layers that provide uh, a safety for passenger vehicles. But when we're looking at uh, pedestrians and bikes, we still have uh, uh, transport agency, transportation agencies that uh, work diligently to try and make the environment as safe as possible for pedestrians. But then when we look at the industry, uh, maybe this should be smaller, but uh, there is very limited uh, a buffer that's provided by the industry for pedestrians and bicyclists. There are very few, uh, there are some examples of uh, now also car makers are actually incorporating pedestrian airbags and then taking into account how to design their vehicles in a way that would reduce the likelihood of, uh, uh, of an injury given a crash with a pedestrian or a bicyclist. But, uh, 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 but in general, there is no industry that also provides additional safety buffers for pedestrians and bicyclists. For pedestrians, it's probably difficult to think about how can the industry improve their health. But for bicyclists, maybe there are ways. Maybe the industry just has not uh, uh, picked up on that, or maybe it's not pushed enough. Uh, um, the other day, I went into a, um, I to tune up my bike, and I asked the person at the bike store, so what is the safest bike that you have? And he was, and he was like, um, I don't know. I've never been asked that question. And he says, oh, maybe the upright ones are a little bit safer. But uh, uh, so I asked him, so what is the difference between all the bikes that you have here? And he said, oh, performance and this, uh, 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 and this frame is made from some uh, carbon fiber that's especially strong and, uh, um, and will never break and is very light and it was actually tuned perfectly in a wind tunnel. And if you would go into a Honda dealership and you would ask them what's your safest car, they'll be able to tell you in a second. So uh, it might also be that the bicycle industry maybe has not picked up on the need to actually uh, think of how they can actually allocate resources to maybe improve the safety of their riders also. But uh, with respect to what I'm presenting here, there is a very limited uh, uh, safety buffer provided by the industry for pedestrians and bicyclists. And then, of course, there's the road users, the road users themselves, who uh, uh, try to make sure that they're safe. So when we look at it this way, uh, uh, um, this is the third reason why it is important for agencies to conduct uh, uh, or to dedicate resources and efforts for road safety management uh, for pedestrians. It might be possible to, uh, uh, or at least to the same uh, extent as they do for other road users. So uh, now that I've uh, presented what, uh, uh, what are three reasons, as I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir, as Anastasia said, but, but uh, uh, it's important to also uh, uh, establish what are specific things that make uh, uh, road safety management important. And, uh, um, and moving on with my presentation, I want to uh, describe here some principles of road safety management that we've identified as a result of research and work that we've done uh, with Caltrans and other agencies. And uh, uh, road safety management is effectively just a set of goals and activities to improve safety. And what we've uh, um, learned is that these eight principles or components that we've identified here work best not, if they're, uh, uh, not as individuals but more in concert as a set of activities that actually complement each other. 
And in the rest of my talk, I'll show a little bit how they uh, uh, support each other, how they feed on information from each other, and how all together they uh, 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 can help provide uh, a safer environment. Uh, so I'll briefly just describe what each of these mean, and then uh, I'll focus a little bit more on three of them. Uh, the first uh, principle, the first component is infrastructure data. And as Anastasia presented, there are a lot of uh, um, uh, built environment attributes and features that matter for safety. And as part of a road safety management plan or strategies, that data needs to be collected and that data needs to be documented and saved in a database that would then allow to conduct analysis and to conduct uh, 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 and to identify what is the effectiveness of different design. The second component is volume data. And going back to my previous slides about trends, there is one, there's a big part that those trends were limited because uh, it did not control for exposure. And when I say exposure, that means the level of activity. So if we're seeing that the number of bicyclist fatalities is going up, it might also be associated with higher level of uh, bicycle activity. If we think that uh, um, automobile safety might not be changing much, it might be associated with a lower level of, uh, of uh, uh, driving mode share. So volume data is essential to be able to understand what are, what are we seeing in the trends. I did not have here crash data because that's... Uh, um, um, uh, pretty much established. Um, it has a lot of limitations, but it's, it's not within the context of this. It's not within the concept of road safety management, but I might touch that later. Uh, the third component is data evaluation, and it's important as part of a process like this to continually use the data that is being collected to do like a little report card, which allows you to monitor regularly what's the big picture uh, trends, what's the big picture uh, um, uh, safety that we're obtaining at the state or a part of the state. The fourth part, and that's actually the core of any road safety management, is hazard assessment. And I'm going to focus on that a little bit more, so I'm not going to spend much time on it here. But hazard assessment, just identifying what are the priorities that uh, 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 the agency wants to dedicate resources to improve traffic safety. The next one is uh, countermeasure selection, and that has two, two parts to it. One is uh, figuring out what countermeasure is appropriate for each problem, but it has another layer that I think is more important for pedestrians and bicyclists is, is the existing toolbox appropriate to address the challenges that, uh, that we're facing? And uh, uh, one small example of that is uh, um, on the state highway system, there is a, 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 a pretty big number of pedestrian fatalities and injuries that are on access-restricted facilities. And so pedestrians are not allowed to be on these facilities, yet they still get injured there. And when you look at the, uh, um, at the toolboxes that are available to address that, there aren't much. The toolbox or the, um, it can be a fence, but the very limited ability or an agency has very limited ability to affect these type of things. So it highlights the need to uh, think about not just what countermeasures work for which solution, but what countermeasures are we missing from our toolbox. Uh, the next item is economic appraisal, and in a, uh, it's basically just a benefit cost uh, analysis to help evaluate which is the best uh, way to allocate resources, followed by the engine that drives everything, which is a funding mechanism. And the last, but certainly not least, is institutionalization. And, uh, uh, and that's making sure that across the agency or across the, the entity of question that people are aware that this is something that the tools are available and that this is something that is of, of interest and to keep on talking about these things so that everyone knows that uh, uh, it's a priority. So uh, uh, in my talk today, what I will focus on most is uh, uh, infrastructure data, then volume data, and then uh, um, hazard assessment. So for infrastructure data, a uh, big challenge is figuring out, okay, what is the data that we want to collect? 
But once you've figured out, the second challenge is how we're going to collect it and how we're going to store it. And uh, when you look at the roadway, it has so many uh, uh, parts and, be and bits and pieces to it. It has uh, uh, um, uh, buffers and sidewalks, and then there are lanes in each direction, and then there's a median in the middle, and then there are crosswalks. And when you try to think about all that together, it's a bit overwhelming, and it's very difficult to pinpoint what are the pieces of information that you need. So one way to address that is to identify uh, what are the anchors, what are the uh, pieces of information that can be used as the core that the rest of the elements or data elements will be linked directly to that. And one way to do that, one way to do that is, oh, this is just their labels. So as I described, we have, um, sorry, sidewalk, buffer. This is the uh, um, approach for the cars median, and crosswalks and intersections. And it's available on both sides. But when we want to identify a core, we've learned that uh, um, thinking about the, uh, that the intersections and the approaches can be used as the core and all of the rest of the elements can be linked directly to that. And, uh, um, and the way it works, or the way we're defining an approach, is that approach is, is basically uh, a directional link between two intersections. So for example, if we have here intersection N2, and then we have on the other side intersection N1, so we can immediately define approach A1 as the link between from, a, from N2 to N1. Now I'm realizing I have my glasses on, which probably means I'm not thinking as well as I did before, so I'll take it off, but it's difficult. Uh, um, but this is a way that allows us to, uh, uh, to define a core, and then each agency can determine which are the variables of interest and can link it directly to that. And we have here an example of such a, a, a formal statement of a formal infrastructure database that uh, uh, shows how that works. Now, to collect that data is challenging by itself. And we've, uh, uh, I'm presenting here a, a, a study that we did uh, for Caltrans, actually, that came to the conclusion that a lot of this data can be collected pretty simply from your office using Google Earth or Google Maps. And we developed a protocol that allows you to measure uh, uh, specific dimensions in the roadway and count uh, specific, so it can be uh, uh, street lights or width of a crosswalk and so on. And uh, uh, we did it very simply here by just ha having students collect the data. But uh, as technology, with emerging technology, you might also be able to collect that uh, uh, without people. And uh, uh, Google and other companies are probably able to provide uh, such services pretty soon. Volume data. Um, so going back to uh, uh, crashes and safety. So what we have here, we have here uh, a, a map that shows uh, spots with uh, pedestrian crashes. And we have here the size of the circle is associated with the number of crashes. So the largest circles are five or six pedestrian crashes. The smaller ones are smaller numbers. And if we take a look at this map that has just the absolute number of crashes, as I presented in the trends earlier, it tells us a story that, oh, the most interesting point is actually in Alameda, or in the city of Alameda, and that's where we need to look at potential, uh, uh, in this case, pedestrian safety concerns. But, um, but if we actually have pedestrian exposure at these locations, and pedestrian exposure is just like volumes and counts, it's the actual level of pedestrian activity at these locations, we get a slightly different story. And we can see that once we calculate the crash, the crash risk, which is crash divided by exposure, exposure or counts is the same thing, we, get, we suddenly get a different picture. So Alameda is no longer the highest priority, and there are other two locations. So uh, when we're conducting traffic safety studies and evaluation, it is essential to have pedestrian exposure because it can guide the discussion this way or another. And uh, a big challenge is, of course, uh, uh, collecting this data. 
Uh, it's typically done uh, manually, but now more and more technologies are emerging. I think Caltrans is using a technology called MyoVision, and this is a summary of an NCHRP report that evaluated different technologies for a pedestrian and bicycle counts. An important thing to mention here is that when we think about the institutionalization, it makes sense uh, for an agency to prioritize uh, pedestrian and bicycle counts whenever vehicle counts are conducted because the uh, uh, data collection uh, individuals might already be out there at the site, there might already be technologies that are doing it, and it's really important to try and institutionalize that when you're out there, you're also collect you're collecting data for all modes and not just for a specific mode. Uh, uh, if you're not familiar, this is a, uh, there's an NCHR, NCHRP report 797 that described in very, uh, we were involved in this study too, that describes in detail what are the advantages and disadvantages of different uh, pedestrian and bicycle counting technologies. Um, so once we have that data, we can actually conduct more meaningf meaningful analyses about what are the locations of interest in this case this is a study that was done over a corridor. Now, I do want to mention that uh, conducting counts at every single location is a bit too much, and that would not be possible within a reasonable amount of time. So the way we address that is we develop models that are based on land use attributes that uh, allow us to uh, uh, estimate with some confidence interval what is the level of activity at the specific site. So even if we cannot cover all of the locations, we can still develop a model that would tell us what is the expected pedestrian or bicycle activity at different locations. Uh, and uh, hazard assessment. So, uh, uh, um, so when we talk about hazard assessment, there are two main approaches. On the left here, we have the hotspot approach, which I'm sure many of you are familiar, and that the hotspot approach is just identifying locations that have higher than expected pedestrian crashes. The parallel approach that is up and coming and more and more agencies are looking into that is called the systemic approach. And according to the systemic approach, you look for specific facilities or specific designs that you want to improve in several places across your network. Uh, um, uh, they have their relative advantages and disadvantages, but from a systemic approach perspective, the benefits are that it, it doesn't uh, uh, replace the hotspot approach, it complements it because it allows you to reach the place, places that's more difficult uh, to identify using the spot approach. It requires less data, it has a widespread effect, and it can uh, 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 prevent specific crash types. The drawback is that justifying a systemic approach uh, or kind of blanket improvements across multiple places can be difficult. Uh, uh, so this is just a, a simple example of the of the hotspot approach. So we have here nine crashes uh, um, along a, a, a stretch of a of a road network, and and if we de we, de we define a specific window length, then we can move a sliding window through the network and look for sites that meet our criteria. In this case, the criteria is you need to have two crashes or more. Uh, uh, sometimes it would find two, sometimes it would find three, but it would uh, uh, cover your network and look for your hotspots. And then those are spots that you can investigate. The systemic approach, and I'm kind of uh, uh, um, skipping here a bit, the systemic approach um, does not look for specific locations. It actually looks for specific facilities. And the way that uh, we're doing it here is, again, we're creating a matrix where the rows represent different types of crashes. So we have here, it's probably difficult for you to read, but we have here right-turning vehicle uh, crashes or unsafe speed. So it has a variety of crash types. And the, co the columns represent different location types. So it can be an unsignalized high-speed location or a signalized low-speed location and so on. And when we process such a matrix, what we actually get is a picture or a map of what type of crashes are happening on what type of facilities. And that allows us to then identify something that we're calling a systemic hotspot. 
So it doesn't direct us to a specific location that we need to investigate. It directs us to a specific cell or a specific combination of crashes that is of interest. In this case, it identifies pedestrian right-of-way in crosswalk crashes on signalized high-speed narrow intersections. And then the idea is that uh, you would think of what are the appropriate countermeasures to uh, apply at not just one intersection, but a number of sites. In this case, that number is uh, uh, to be 20 or less. It doesn't have to be at every single site. But it allows you to identify uh, challenges or challenging locations on your network. Now, uh, uh, on top of that, we can also put a layer of countermeasures. And the way we do that, we again go back to the same matrix, and for each of the cells, we pre-filter all of the tools or all of the uh, 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 um, programs that we can do to address that specific challenge. So, for example, here we have these numbers represent different types of countermeasures. So we have here uh, different uh, countermeasures that can be applied for our systemic hotspot. So um, I'll skip this a bit. But I do want to emphasize uh, one more thing about this matrix. Because uh, uh, over here, we're looking at this more from an engineering uh, uh, improvements as a transportation agencies, but it doesn't necessarily need to end at that. And if uh, uh, we're now thinking of Vision Zero and the idea to uh, uh, work across different E's, engineering, education, enforcement, to reduce crashes, we can actually use frameworks like that to identify not only what are the engineering solutions that we can apply to reduce a specific systemic hotspot, but then also what are the educational programs that can address that specific thing, or what are the enforcement activities that can address that specific thing, and then together work to reducing crashes in specific cells. So, uh, um, so to summarize, um, I, I described the principles of road safety management and I described a little bit how do they interact with each other and how they rely on each other. And um, I also have here this additional uh, diagram that shows that at the core of road safety management we always have hazard assessment and it relies on crash data and on volume data and it should, but it should always lead to direct countermeasures, economic appraisal and, economic appraisal and funding. Uh, um, so to summarize, we've, uh, I described three things that uh, show us why we need to prioritize road safety management for pedestrians and bicyclists, and then something about potential road safety management strategies. Thank you. was really fabulous and a lot of uh, really good research conveyed there. Uh, you know, I particularly liked, um, Anastasia, your talk where you really went through a whole litany of design interventions, which I think were really helpful. And then offer, I found uh, your methodological discussion about how to look at relative vulnerability and what kind of data sources we could be looking at to help in assessment of hotspots and other types of locations also really helpful. But I will say that at the beginning of your talk, I found some of the data disturbing. Mm -hmm. So I think, Anastasia, you had a seven percentage point decline in walking over the, the last 50 years. Walking to work. Walking to work, okay. But that's, that's notable, right? And then Offer had similar uh, statistics. You know, 17% uh, increase in pedestrian fatalities since 2010. 41% increase in bike fatalities in California. So I was really curious when you were giving all this, all this data, you know, how, how does the U.S., how does California compare to other nations? I know you had made a couple of observations about Stockholm, but I was, I was just curious, you know, what, where do we stand relative to other nations? We have a lot of ground to cover, I would say. Uh, partly it is because a lot of our cities were developed, especially in the West Coast, around the automobile and much more horizontal expansion, that it is much more difficult to connect the different points to one another, and so you have to get on the automobile. 
so partly it is urban form related, partly it is uh, cultural, and I think, uh, as I mentioned, we've seen quite a lot of change. I wish we had numbers to show. I mean, the numbers I showed were work, uh, walking to work. Mm -hmm. I think we now understand much more how important it is walking for health, and I'm willing to an educated guess is that people may be overall walking more for recreation or around the block, but still we don't know. But, you know, there are a lot of things that uh, especially European countries are doing to promote. Uh, they're much more willing than we are to keep the automobile away from certain parts of, of the city or to allow only cabs or um, they're walking and biking is so much part of the car. I mean, to give you an idea, I have been doing some work on high-speed rail uh, for a number of years now in California and what we can learn from uh, other countries. And if you go to a lot of uh, European countries, in Spain, in Germany, in France, what you, you're coming close to the high-speed rail station and you have so much bike space. I mean, you see all these bikes that are parked there. And here, uh, the plants you know, hope there is going to be some biking, but it's mostly about how many uh, thousands of cars we would need to be next to. So there are 5,000, 6,000. And the equivalent of, for example, in Barcelona, uh, that is one of the most well-used, probably the most well-used uh, high-speed rail station in Spain, Barcelona, and of course, Madrid, Atoka, and they have parking for less than 1,000 cars. Uh, and they have a lot of bike space. So we still have a lot of ground to cover, and some of that is through policy and some of that through design mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we really need to do better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Offer, can you take a stab at that? Yeah, so uh, um, I really hope that, uh, um, that the mode share for pedestrians and bicyclists is going up and we're not necessarily able to capture it with traditional tools or with uh, um, um, older surveys because the increase, as you said, in the number of fatalities is disturbing. Uh, uh, if it's going up because more people are biking and walking, it's not good, but, that's a, a, um, but, that, but we need to know that. We need to know if the numbers are going up because people are walking and biking more and we're not necessarily capturing it in traditional tools, maybe it's because recreational activity. I know a lot of uh, there's a lot of recreational bicycle activity that's typically not captured by the more standard tools. Uh, um, but it kind of highlights the fact that if it's going up by such significant numbers, the number of fatalities, we need to first of all be able to know is it going up because there's increased mode share, or is it just going up as absolute values irrespective of increased mode share. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. So when you were both talking, uh, I work on a lot of advanced technology. It, it was just coming up through my, my mind throughout both of your presentations. What do you guys think about the role of connected vehicle technology or even the automated vehicle? And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion and controversy, I think, around the automated vehicle from both the bike and ped communities. So what do you think, like, what are the opportunities but also possible obstacles associated with advanced technologies? And you define advanced technologies as the driverless cars? Well, it could or also, or it, could, it could also, yeah, could, could be IT, you yeah. know, based things. But I thought I'd also, you know, throw in that there has been a lot of discussion and debate I've seen in social media around the issue of like just even the automated vehicle and what this would mean for bike and pedestrians. You know, would it mean the end of us walking around because we're freaked out that we're going to get run over by a robocar? Yeah. In, in my ideal world, Technology and these, you know, advanced technologies work to enhance connectivity of different modes. Because I think that's another issue that we have to face here in the U.S. That our different modes are not well connected with one another. Mm -hmm. So definitely, there are certain journals journeys that you need to get on the car, uh, but there are others that you can use other modes that have to be connected. And if you can use IT to give you more information about how to seamlessly connect, then I think that would be a great uh, use. And of course, you know the bike share yeah. and programs and how, again, if you where you can find your next bike and what, if you can see this in your app, 
um, you know, that, that's something that would be very useful. Yeah. And I think, too, these multimodal apps can also help us navigate safe and unsafe territories as Absolutely. well. And I wonder if the, th that's getting built in more and more into things you know, as we're, as we're creating these multimodal apps, like these are unsafe areas, that type of thing. I was using Google Maps recently um, in another country, and it told me to avoid an area. Mm. Because but, of traffic safety problems? Tra or traffic or safety, crime, or? And I, but I also inquired, and it appeared to be a high crime area as well. This was very controversial. I read something about that, and some of the neighborhoods were up in arms yeah. if they're going to be further stigmatized, if, you know, that's yeah. something to be very I, careful about. Yeah. Scared. I had not ever experienced that before, but I, I yeah. did experience it. It was actually in the Netherlands when I was using Google Maps to just plot my route from a transit yeah. station to, to walk, and it huh. basically said you should be very careful. So, Offer, what are your thoughts? Um, so the short answer is we don't know. But then uh, uh, with respect to uh, um, vehicle automation, uh, in my mind it's uh, probably easier to teach uh, a computer or high level of technology to watch out for all road users than it is to teach drivers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, so there is a pretty big potential there for uh, smart vehicles to uh, look for all road users mm -hmm. um, because they have the capacity. Uh, now, will the execution uh, uh, fulfill that? I don't really know, mm -hmm. but I think that, that there is a, there is a potential here for safety improvements. Uh, for pedestrians and bicyclists when uh, a higher level of vehicle technologies are added. I can speak for, and this is more anecdotal, but uh, um, uh, 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 I own a car. Um, and in our car, we have a right-hand side uh, mirror. I'm sorry, a camera. Mm -hmm. So whenever you turn right, there's a little uh, camera that helps you look at what's happening at the right side of the car. And initially, I did, not, I did not think of that as something that I need. But in practice, I'm learning that it actually is extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's extremely helpful if I need to look for bicyclists when I'm turning right. It's extremely helpful if I need to look for uh, pedestrians. And in general, it covers a lot of uh, um, blind spots that I would typically have. So, it's a, uh, so even if you don't go all the way into driverless car adding technology can help us as, uh, 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 as road users mm -hmm. uh, to be safer. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to, to um, weave this into the conversation because, you know, I know Caltrans is really involved, you know, not just in the planning process, but also looking forward into the research process. You know, how could advanced technologies be used to go beyond some of the recommendations that, that you guys provided? So... Anastasia, we actually had a question for you from the online community, oh, so I'd like to, to, to posit that. Uh, could you address recent articles that have been in the LA Times regarding the pros and cons of road diets? I'm not familiar. When, if this happened in the summer, it was actually in another part you were, of You the were world. traveling. So you were the, doing your like, European research? Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, but I don't know what the articles were talking about. Mm -hmm. No. Anybody who read these articles and what they're saying that could comment? No one? Yes. Juan. What did they say? Juan, do you, do you want to grab, grab a mic just so you get recorded for the online folks? Thank you. Yes, we want, you to, we want you, them to be able to hear you. Yeah, basically these are the efforts of the city of LA to calm some of the streets uh, that had been affected uh, by safety issues yes. towards pedestrians and bicycles. So for example, removing a couple of lanes, including yes, a median. Yes, yes. Oh, that's planned so 2035. Yes, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, Los Angeles is trying very hard uh, to you know, shift its image from a city around the, the automobile to a city that is much more uh, friendly for pedestrians and, and bicyclists. And as part of that is the new plan for 2035, where it really tries to um, take out lanes, create more bike lanes, uh, make sidewalks uh, larger and all that. I'm very much in favor of that. There, there are... Um, there is a lot of controversy and a lot of concern because people find that there is a lot of congestion in LA and so you are making it easier. There is a kind of, a, they see it as a, um, 
you know, black and white, that, you know, you, you're favoring pedestrians and cyclists, the, the drivers are going to lose. Uh, I don't think that this is necessarily the case for the simple reason that we have so much automobile space in, in Los Angeles. I mean, so much of the city is, you know, pavement. So uh, doing a kind of a, if, if you were to go and take the, the, the lanes, of course, it's going to create some uh, congestion. But if we really do a more comprehensive work and kind of see how this traffic can be diverted to where and how do we use possibly one or other, another arterial, because there are a lot of arterials around Los Angeles. I'm not advocating of bringing traffic inside uh, the neighborhoods, but there are all these east-west arterials that some of them are better than others in terms of traffic, and some of them definitely can accommodate more traffic. Uh, so there are, I think, if, if we were just simply going to put a plan together that takes out lanes and, um, you know, widens sidewalks and uh, puts bike, way, bike lanes and do nothing else, this might be problematic in terms of traffic, but if we try to see it in a more comprehensive way of how do we use the extra uh, road space that we have for the automobiles to accommodate and divert and all that. It takes more work, but I think it, it can happen. But it's very controversial right now in, in LA. A lot of people fighting it, a lot of people in favor. Wonderful. So we have um, another clarifying question for you, Anastasia, but I thought maybe we take a moment to turn it back to our live audience right here at Caltrans to see if anybody had a question for Offer or Anastasia. Okay, it looks like we have a couple. Oh, Great. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is uh, with regard to the chart that Anastasia, you put up of uh, a variety of uh, policy proposals or actions that could be taken. A very and I noticed chart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, offer you can, I, perhaps you have experience from Safe Truck as well. But uh, I wondered if you had any experience or knew from the literature the impact of driver safety programs. Uh, for those of us who all raised our hands about walking to school, I think we all went to mm -hmm. California High School where you did have indeed driver training. Yes. And we no longer have that and we uh, have, I would pose perhaps a lower level of enforcement and higher speeds and many more drivers from all walks of life. Yeah. I think in Sacramento region, even in the past few months, we've seen some very tragic uh, bi bicycle and pedestrian deaths. Yeah. And I just uh, wonder what your experience is with uh, programs that focus on the driver and not just educating yeah. the bicyclists or the pedestrians. No, I think you, you raise a very good point that some of these, um, I don't know, it's probably because of lack of funding or the funding was diverted to other programs, but I think that both drivers and pedestrians and cyclists need to be to have more education about you know how to navigate the road and whenever we have these they're always you know kind of the evaluations tell us that they do a lot of a lot of good um, but I want to also emphasize that there are studies that also show that certain neighborhoods are even more vulnerable than others and so for example um, in LA it, my own study looking into 2007, where the pedestrian automobile crashes were occurring, were a lot of Latino neighborhoods that were more vulnerable. And even, um, and, and these were neighborhoods of very recent immigrants and their kids that uh, I think, you know, even training and education, I have in mind in, in New York and in some of the communities in Harlem, th third graders are uh, being, there is a kind of a an intersection that is created and, and kind of educated how to cross the street. Now, I'm, these are not the drivers, but I just, I want to make the point that education targeting drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists is very important, and if we don't have money to do it unilaterally, at least let's focus where most vulnerable neighborhoods are and kind of do that. And I, in my mind, the most vulnerable neighborhoods are a lot of immigrant neighborhoods, a lot of neighborhoods where a lot of senior citizens, and a lot of neighborhoods with kids. Yeah. So let's focus the attention there. 
Yeah, and related to that, and, and then I'll, I'll let you definitely chime in. Just this, this uh, was one of the questions that came from the online community, was, you know, could we emphasize more in our, I guess, educational campaigns the greater risks of driving, and would that help to encourage active transportation? You know, that there's yes. risks associated with driving. So could you, do you address that, Anastasia? To, 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 through education to praise the, you know, the alternative modes? No, absolutely. But also, I also want to, to say that the trends are also encouraging. My colleagues at UCLA, um, Brian Taylor and Abby Blumenberg, they really studied the patterns of millennials, yeah. and they find that they're not as anxious to be driving, uh, and they're much more open to utilizing alternative modes. And uh, I think that, you know, starting at an, at an early age through education is, is important. Yeah. Would, you, would you like to add anything to that um, offer? Because you were talking about, you know, the vulnerability of people to um, to the automobile itself. Yeah. So maybe before that, a, a comment about uh, training. So uh, 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 training is effective. Uh, it's challenging because it is very difficult to quantify the actual effectiveness of that. But it has been shown uh, that it has a lot of benefits. Uh, a challenge that I think uh, that we've noticed with respect to training is how to develop the appropriate content to actually have an impact. Because, uh, uh, because a lot of people feel that education and training programs have a lot of value, sometimes they're not thought through to the level of detail that you would want to, uh, uh, to understand exactly how should it be uh, 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 conducted so that the benefits would be maximized. And I think that uh, some of the things we're probably still working on with respect to conducting research of how to get people uh, more aware of these things to help people, how to make the right decisions. And uh, this is a, a, a kind of a side comment also about children. Uh, there is recent research that's showing that children under the age, I think it's uh, seven, uh, don't have the cognitive ability to understand uh, what it means to cross a road. So they're programmed to teach children to cross a road at different ages, ages that are less than seven. But uh, it turns out that now that we're conducting more and more cognitive research of children, that they actually cannot fully understand what are the risks and what are the complexities of crossing a road. It's seeing that the car is moving in your direction, con uh, making the eye contact, and then actually understanding the risk that, is, that can happen as a result of that. So that uh, speaks back to the need of, uh, of uh, educational and training programs that uh, are designed uh, in a way that would actually work. And that probably also speaks a bit yeah. Uh, um, yeah. to uh, info about uh, the greater risks of driving. Can it help encourage active transportation? It's all about how uh, uh, you develop a training program in a way that you can have these benefits. So, Madonna, I think there were a few yes, other hands. Okay, there you are. Yep. <laughs> so, so, I'm Matt Freeman. I work here in traffic operations, and I was previously a school board member. And so, I'm looking at the home to work trip to also being a home to school trip. And two issues kind of pop up. One is that of designing of emerging and new neighborhoods that encourage through traffic by bikes and peds versus a nice loop buzz and cul de sacs that help minimize traffic racing that people want in their suburban neighborhoods but discourage straight line travel because there's no connectivity. And um, <clears throat> creating an environment where the kids could walk or bike to school directly. The next part deals with perception on the part of electeds as well as parents where there's a general fear of even encouraging uh, biking or walking because the school districts don't want to give the impression of sanctioning a particular route. They are fearful of liability. liability. And so, you know, you have many, many layers that have developed going, if you look at the chart in your first part of your presentation, uh, poly classes kidnapping made every parent afraid of stranger abduction. So uh, walking back is getting the school districts to feel more comfortable in terms of policy of advocating for biking and walking, and then as we develop new neighborhoods, creating neighborhoods that facilitate that movement. Yeah. No, these are all very valid comments. The, the irony with the polyclass um, case is that uh, it, it, it was a horrible case, uh, but it made everyone so fearful. But in terms of the actual numbers 
of you know stranger danger they have really gone they are either flat or going down so the, the danger is more in the perception, which comes back to what I was saying earlier, that the perception is as real as, as reality. And you're also very, very uh, much on the mark about um, the schools and the school districts. I actually was uh, trying to convince my kids' high school. They have now graduated a long time ago. Uh, they had problems with, you know, parking space, and I was trying to convince them to work with the city and kind of lower the traffic and all that, I was so successful, or rather unsuccessful, that the school built a huge underground parking structure at a huge cost, this was a private school, at a huge cost because they just didn't want to deal with, uh, for the reasons that you said, they did not want to be perceived as encouraging walking or biking because if, you know, something was going to happen, they, someone could sue them. But, but, you know, this is, unfortunate, I would say. And I think that design of a neighborhood, especially of new subdivisions, but also there are ways to retrofit um, older suburban areas to make them much more uh, friendly. But there are also, in terms of the policy, there are neighborhoods where they started, some parents started the, um, forget now the name, they're calling, yes, mm -hmm. where an adult every time it changes, uh, either on a bike or walking, is responsible of you know, 10, 15 kids going to school. Um, again, this requires social capital and requires kind of close-knit communities and volunteerism. So it can be tackled at different levels, at the policy level, at the design level, at the social capital level. Uh, but I think we really need to try to, to, to change that because I think it's, it's problematic at different levels. It's problematic at the fact that, um, you know, it takes people time to drive their kids around. It kind of, the independent mobility of children has decreased tremendously. They are not allowed to walk around the block. And it also adds more cars on, on the street and more costs to create parking spaces near the, the schools. So it is, it is an issue. Anything to add to that offer, or are you, nope. you're, you're good? All right, so we're, I'm going to go back to the online community. We'll just take turns. So we have a, a question for both of you about the introduction of lower-speed uh, vehicles and you know how they can mutually benefit greenhouse gas emissions, but also what role could they play in encouraging uh, bike and pedestrian modes? Lower speed um, vehicles, electric cars, and uh, I, I, I would imagine that's cards? that's what? probably the low speed um, technology is what this this individual is getting at. So lower speed Do you want to? Um, neighborhood electric that vehicles, that type of thing. So the, how would that affect? Uh, so you know you could couple couple that with multiple goals, right? So yeah. perhaps we achieve greenhouse gas emission reductions, but we, you know what could it, that do to promote what the bike I, and pedestrian uh, community? Well, what I would say that studies do show that the higher the speed, the you know the more the, the, fear, more the danger right? and the more the fear. The, so the there, you know, one would think that if all the vehicles um, were low speed and yeah. that would improve. But you can also accomplish that in, in residential neighborhoods with lowering the speed limit and putting speed you know, bumps, speed bumps and, and traffic doing calming. the traffic calming mm -hmm. devices. I think it's easier to do that than expect that everybody would buy the low speed uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree with that comment. So indeed, the uh, uh, high speed are uh, something that makes uh, pedestrians and bicyclists very uncomfortable and that they're much less likely uh, to walk or bike. And if, uh, I'm not familiar with this, uh, these specific type of vehicles, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, if indeed there is a, a trend to try and purchase more low-speed vehicles, then that would mm -hmm. uh, be able to achieve both benefits, mm -hmm. greenhouse gases yeah, and Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of discussion about possibly trying to create low-speed zones mm -hmm. in cities, and so vehicles that only travel at a reduced um, yes. speed would be allowed in those areas, and I think that's what this is getting at. So, you know, it, is it a multi-objective kind of mm -hmm. uh, strategy where we can lower emissions, but we could also, at the same time, encourage people to, to walk more yeah. 
more because there aren't all of these high-speed vehicles, you know, zooming around, zooming around yeah. them. Yeah. And that, that's also related to, uh, from a safety, a direct safety perspective, and it speaks back a bit to the Vision Zero type of thoughts yeah. that uh, you're supposed to, an environment that is expected to have a lot of pedestrians and bicyclists should not allow a, a speed limit above a certain uh, uh, number. And the way they come up with the numbers in European countries is they, there's a certain level of risk that they're willing to accept a certain probability of fatality given a crash. And those numbers are typically lower than the speed limits that you would see in the U.S. for uh, urban environments. So it's more like 15 or sometimes uh, 20 miles per hour. So they, uh, if it, they determine that an area is expected to have a lot of pedestrians and bicyclists, then the speed limit is actually lower to allow for them to allow them to uh, walk and bike in those uh, locations more comfortably. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So why don't we go back to uh, our live audience right here? I think uh, Madonna's got the microphone. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about the um, what, what I call the false exemptions of smart growth, so-called smart growth. In other words, um, what I'm seeing happen is that um, rather than out of transportation interest, um, actually for developer interest, um, we're getting exemptions for both parking and for um, the effect um, on traffic modeling um, uh, that's being pushed by the regional MPOs. Um, so the effect of this is that they're building in uh, downtown areas, um, core areas, core and corridor areas, uh, these four and five story buildings. Um, they're saying, well, you know, this is actually a um, uh, you know, these people aren't really going to use their cars or have cars. So we'll just, you know, require that every other unit needs to have a, a parking space. And then they're saying, well, they're not going to have cars. So the effect on traffic will actually be uh, much less than, um, you know, would be predicted otherwise. And uh, what, what has happened is that, um, uh, you know, some of these areas are actually being much more impacted by cars uh, the traffic is turning into gridlock. Um, a good example is Washington Street in Petaluma, where they've done a lot of uh, smart growth downtown, and Washington Street is now impacted very heavily. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, a, a friend of mine in Southern California who's a transit a advocate um, used to be very much in favor of these buildings that would magically have people who would ride transit. And now she's very much against it because um, she's actually putting a study together that's showing that they've made all these promises that these are transit-oriented developments. And uh, what's actually happened is transit funding has gone down and there's less transit and all these people have cars. Um, so I'm wondering how we can get away from this, um, the, these false exemptions and, 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 you know, actually have, if you build something that's smart, you actually have to do something that makes it, uh, um, you know, more friendly to uh, bicycles and pedestrians and transit. Any any comments on that? Lowering the parking well, minimums. You, this is a very valid point, and uh, we're actually doing a study right now that looks with colleagues from Berkeley that really looks into the another aspect, which is, um, you know, gentrification and displacement because of where some of these transit-oriented developments enter, uh, there were um, existing lower-income population that were more transit-dependent, and they are replaced by TODs that bring a higher-income population that they're not transit-dependent, and they use, still use their cars. So this is an issue. I have to say it's not everywhere. I mean, I don't think that we can paint everything white or black when it comes to TOD. And our work, the, the, the state, which it is funded by the California Air Resources Board, the study, really wants some policy guidance. And we're looking, we're trying very hard to see what, you know, what do you do in terms of increasing some of the affordability and really serving really the transit-dependent population that are more likely to. Um, also, we're looking into commercial gentrification, and we hope to get funded for a proposal that really we try to see if this commercial gentrification, if the new, you know, very hype stores bring actually more traffic uh, crashes because people come with their cars instead of walking in. So it is, it is a very valid 
concern and uh, it has to be looked at, I would say, contextually because not, it's not everywhere and also what can you do in terms of policy, not give these incentives or give different incentives to developers or try to incorporate more affordable housing units in some of these and all that. But it's not, it's not an easy response, I would say. So back to um, our online uh, community. So there's an additional question about road diets and traffic calming. So the question is, there's been concerns about first responder vehicles being unduly delayed because of certain treatments in this regard. And is there any data to support this and these considerations? Do you know? Um, yeah. I, I can try. So... Uh, um, Yes, yeah, so when you uh, redesign a road and you add traffic calming devices and ball belts, so there's the concern that uh, um, uh, first responders, it will take them longer to reach uh, specific destinations. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of any data to support these concerns, but uh, uh, to some extent, a lot of these concerns can be addressed by also uh, maybe making adjustments to the first responder fleet. So if the urban environment changes a little bit and it's a priority of uh, policymakers to make the city more friendly to pedestrians and bicyclists, so there might also be room to then gradually uh, change the fleet of the first respondents so that they are, would be able to better navigate that, uh, uh, um, um, these type of roads. Mm -hmm. so, uh, um, so, uh, um, so it is, it is a concern, it is something that uh, we need to think about but it shows that whenever you're making changes to the environment, you need to think of all of the uh, road users that would be affected by it. And uh, uh, in my mind, this is a solvable problem with uh, modifying uh, uh, practices in some of the vehicle fleets of first responders. Right. So I wanted to ask you guys a question again. Um, you know, given that we're here today at Caltrans and we're, you know, thinking about both planning and research, you know, what role um, can partnerships with uh, local stakeholders play as Caltrans looks at, you know, increasing more bike and ped modes, which is part of their strategic plan? So what, you know, what role can those partnerships play? And local stakeholders, you mean the MPOs and the planning departments? And, and, and possibly the businesses, right, and in businesses. communities. Yeah, like how, what, would, what kind of advice would you give, you know, our audience here at Caltrans as they look to the future and meeting their, their strategic goals to increase accessibility and livability around bikes and peds? You know, how could they work, you know, more in concert with the local community? What types of advice might you be able to give? Well, I think that Caltran has one big power. I think it is funding, and you're funding the local stakeholders. And I think uh, you may already be doing that, so please educate me, because I don't know how the process of funding and how you, how you choose certain funding over other, but I think if there is an emphasis or points gained uh, with these local plans that or local projects that have to do with uh, what are the specific measures that we take to increase alternative modes of transportation. How do we do it? How much the, the local community is, is involved? I mean, there must be some kind of scoring that happens for these projects, and you may already be doing that, mm -hmm. but I think that if, if the message is very clear that this is something that uh, Caltrans is going to look very carefully in terms of awarding these uh, pro projects, I am willing to bet that the local stakeholders are going to listen. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I think Caltrans has an active transportation program that funds local bike and ped improvements to the tune of about 100 to $200 million per year. So this is definitely an avenue mm -hmm. to encourage local stakeholders. Offer, did you have any thoughts? Um, maybe I can add to that a little bit, that uh, the biggest challenge, or as opposed to more automobile-centered uh, uh, work, the collaboration with local agencies uh, for pedestrian, and especially bicycle issues, should be uh, as great as possible because uh, um, uh, the locals are probably dealing with these challenges uh, to at least and probably even a larger extent 
than Caltrans. So, uh, um, so many times the, uh, the locals would have a lot of very valuable information that Caltrans as an agency traditionally, and also because of the nature of the state highway system, hasn't been dealing with as much. So I think that uh, um, with respect to uh, planning, I think that it is the fact that Caltrans has a lot of the funding on their side should not necessarily mean that uh, um, directions and the focus should be uh, uh, one way and that, that Caltrans uh, is encouraged to try and develop that conversation so that a lot of input actually comes from the locals and then maybe together uh, um, uh, or give more weight to what the locals are experiencing, what the locals are recommending and the type of solutions that are coming from these cities in a way that would benefit uh, those cities. But then also Caltrans, through their role as a funder with the active transportation program or other, needs to be able to uh, mobilize these ideas to maybe to cities who haven't thought about that solution or are not necessarily uh, uh, experiencing that problem right now, but would, but if they choose a specific solution, they might experience that problem in the future. So there's probably, a, it, it opens a whole new world that, uh, as opposed to cars, a lot of it is coming from Caltrans to the locals. I think that for pedestrians and bicyclists, the discussion should be much more uh, two-sided. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, Caltrans has recently uh, adopted or endorsed the NACTO guidelines. Uh, and in this regard, this can provide cities more, more flexibility in adopting signage. So I think that's an avenue. And then I think a third avenue is through the California Household Travel Survey that Caltrans funds and implements. This could be an avenue for introducing new questions that might be helpful in you know, providing folks like the researchers here today and others in the community with uh, good data associated with uh, survey-related questions. So uh, we have, you want to go back to the audience? Okay. So what we're going to uh, do is I think we're going to start to ease into wrap up. Yeah, okay. We, we're going to, um, we, we have so many questions actually coming in online, and we're absolutely delighted that there's um, such an appetite for this topic. I think uh, we want to take one last question or comments or feedbacks ac actually on the question regarding uh, Caltrans and the planning process or any others you might have. Recently, HBO did a segment called Bike Wars. I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but it talked about everything that we're discussing here today. But it also touched on um, everyone in Europe and the way that they do things as far as bicycling. And I was wondering, because um, I was quite amazed that they have parking structures for bikes. Mm -hmm. And they're like four-story parking structures there uh, because so many people um, bicycle. We're here, I think, in America, we kind of look at bicycling as something we do on the weekend in more of a recreational aspect. The spandex <laughs> community. <laughs> yeah, so they I, to it. when you touched on safety, when I watched that segment, um, I felt, you know, I, I think I would be more inclined to ride my bike to work if I felt safe. Mm -hmm. So living here in Sacramento, I don't feel safe um, commuting in to work. But I was amazed at the culture in Europe and the way they approach mm -hmm. Um, pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, everyone seems to have a respect for each other. Um, the segment also showed, for instance, if there's an incident of a bicyclist getting hit by a car and the backlash from it. You have the motorist jump out and he's yelling at the bicyclist. The bicyclist says, you were in my lane. And there's just absolutely no respect. So I'm wondering... Um, the culture that they have, say, in Copenhagen or Amsterdam, that seems to be taught um, from a very young age, children are seeing their parents riding bikes um, into work, is, I, do you see America ever <laughs> getting to that point um, to where we will be able to have that type of um, environment when it comes to pedestrians, bicyclists? Um, it's weird. It's going to take time. We, I mean, uh, the best I can give you is that it's getting better. But you are absolutely right. I didn't saw. I didn't see the segment, but I know the situation in Europe very well. Um, and also the fact that 
in, in Holland and in Sweden, the, it's about half men, half women that are cycling, while here it's 15 to 20 percent women, because women are much more afraid to cycle because of a lot of the things that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, the fact that you have the, the priority is the pedestrian and the cyclist. I remember once in Belgium that we were driving to our hotel and we would see the hotel, but we couldn't get to the garage of the hotel <laughs> because the priority, there were you could not cross with a car. It was all bikes and it was not allowed. You had to know how to navigate your car to enter that garage. You will never see that happening here. So, uh, yes, we're seeing things changing. We see cities um, building more and more bikeways. We see some laws of traffic safety uh, changing and all that. But I think it will take quite some time. Uh, and, and partly the, the, the way that our built form is built with these very, very wide streets, very wide lanes that kind of, um, especially in, in arterial streets that uh, people can speed up. This is very dangerous for, for biking, so a lot of people are afraid and they're not going to do it. So that's a big thing. All right. Unfortunately, we, we need to wrap up. It, we're almost at 3 p.m., but I wanted to, to thank our wonderful, informative speakers uh, from the UC Connect family, Offer and Anastasia. So I just want to uh, you know, give you a round of applause. Yes, and so um, for those of you online, please continue to send your questions in. We will uh, respond to them. And I just wanted to congratulate uh, Caltrans, uh, the Division of Transportation Planning, and the Division of Research, Innovation, and System Information, as well as the UC Connect family on a really successful uh, and informative uh, Emerging Trends uh, workshop today. And with that, there's more to come. So you will actually have another opportunity to convene again on October 19th uh, from 10 a.m. to noon. And the next session will be on challenges of suburban office landscapes. So that definitely sounds quite juicy and provocative. So uh, I hope you will welcome uh, the UC Connect team back to uh, take on those questions. Thank you very much. And thank you. I have to call the